Great. I think we'll go ahead and start. I want to uh, first say welcome to everyone who's joining us for the webinar today. My name is Gary Smith, and I direct the Center for Injury Research and Policy at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. And I have the privilege of introducing today's moderator. First, I want to give a shout out to the hosts of today's webinar, the trainees for child injury prevention and prevent child injury. Um, so on behalf of those organizations, um, I'd like to introduce uh, today's webinar. Uh, first, I wanna just say that the webinar will be about an hour long. We'll leave time at the end for questions and answers. So if you wanna type your questions into the chat, we will get to as many of them as time allows. Um, and today's moderator is someone I think uh, many, many of you know, uh, Dr. Rachel Moon. Uh, Dr. Moon is a pediatrician and a SIDS researcher at the University of Virginia. She received her medical uh, degree from Emory University and completed her pediatric residency at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She is the Harrison Distinguished Teaching Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Um, her research focuses on SIDS uh, SIDS risk factors and how parents make decisions uh, regarding those topics. Uh, she is chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on SIDS and is the associate editor of digital media for the journal Pediatrics. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Rachel, to take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gary. Um, it is great to be here with all of you today on this day of action. Um, and I know that many of you were on the, um, the Twitter chat today. Um, I have to say that that was my first Twitter chat ever. And um, it was quite exciting. Um, so, um, but it was really, uh, but seriously, it was really great to see um, so many people enthusiastic in it. Um, and that was really fun. And shout out to Emory um, Pediatric Residency. I was there many, many years ago as a student and so was very, very excited to see all of you um, very active on that chat. Um, okay, so today what we're gonna do, uh, we have a, an amazing panel and I would like to first uh, um, introduce our panel and, um, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Um, so, um, Please, um, when I uh, call your name, um, uh, introduce yourself, who you are, what you are, and then um, how you got into the safe sleep space. Um, so we're going to go in order of um, the, how the presentations are going to go. So um, Jonathan, uh, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Midget. I'm the Consumer Ombudsman at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, I'm a child psychologist and I got into product safety by way of uh, toy regulations, uh, but I became the children's hazards team lead and I was part of the review team that looked at all the incidents that came in related to child fatality and consumer products at the agency. So um, I've read, I don't know how many thousands of, of incident reports and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Um, and Jonathan's going to talk about product safety, which I think is something that is um, that is very, very integrally integrally tied with safe sleep. Um, next, um, Dr. Rebecca Carlin, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, you were sorry. Right. I'm Rebecca Carlin. I'm a uh, pediatric hospitalist at Columbia New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Um, and I am a researcher on safe sleep and a member of the SIDS task force with Dr. Moon. Um, I came into this work uh, sort of fortuitously when I crossed paths with Rachel uh, when I started my early in my academic career, when I started doing work on a project of hers. And I became interested in social networks and norms, which she was looking at um, and how those affected parental decisions. And I have since uh, received a grant from the American SIDS Institute to continue that work. So that's how I got here. Okay. And um, Rebecca, as a hospitalist, will be talking about hospital policies in a little bit. Um, uh, let's see. Barb. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barb Himes, Director of Education and Bereavement Services uh, with First Candle. 
First Candle is a nonprofit, an over 40 year old nonprofit organization that uh, focuses on eliminating sudden unexpected infant death and, um, and bereavement services. So for, we provide support for families who've lost an infant due to miscarriage, stillbirth, or an infant loss. And um, I am also a lactation consultant for over 15 years and a certified doula for the last four, which has been a fun, um, fun little project. Uh, but most importantly, I'm a bereaved parent, and uh, my husband and I woke 40 years ago on Christmas Eve to find our two-month-old two son, Jake, unresponsive in his crib, and um, actually, yesterday was his 41st birthday, would have been his 41st birthday, so I think the best way to describe it is that it's like a wound that heals, but you carry that scar with you forever. Um, I We were fortunate enough to get support from First Candle, the National SIDS Alliance, um, through that difficult time. And um, then it was my effort to join with so many other committed folks that in the field in saving babies' lives. And many of them are on this panel and on the webinar. So thank you for your work. Mine has been driven uh, by and informed by being a parent, a mother of six children, grandmother of 16 and counting, uh, the loss of a son to SIDS, the adoption and parenting of um, a child with special needs. This is truly a labor of love for me, and I thank you for having me today. Thank you, Barb. Um, Lorena. Hello everyone, my name is Lorena Kaplan and I serve as the lead for the Safe to Sleep campaign, formerly the Back to Sleep campaign, at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Hard to follow Barb with that amazing introduction, uh, but I got into the Safe Sleep world because uh, by training I'm an injury prevention and health communication specialist and I had the good fortune of being able to combine both of those skills when I worked in a hospital system that needed to update its safe sleep uh, practices in the hospital uh, to match the 2012 recommendations of the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on SIDS. Um, so I had the opportunity to work with both childbirth educators, early parenting educators, um, hospitalists, um, obstetricians, gynecologists, everyone really who helped families at the Family Maternity Center to implement those uh, policies and practices to keep families and babies safe. And it's thanks to that experience that I knew a little bit about uh, what it would entail to run a national campaign. So with the help of uh, the team at NICHD, that's what I get to do every day. It is a privilege, I acknowledge that, especially because I get to work with such a wonderful group like the panelists who um, are here today. And led by Dr. Moon, I am also a uh, federal consultant to the AAP Task Force on SIDS. So it's great to be here, thank you. Thanks, Lorena. And then Barb and Lorena um, uh, later on in the, in the webinar are gonna be talking about resources and about um, disparities um, and about communication with families. Um, so um, let's go ahead and get started with the actual content. I'm gonna start off and um, with just kind of an overview for everyone. And I'm gonna share my slides here. Um, I just have a few slides that I, I thought it would just be easier if I if I just uh, shared them. Um, so these are the the A level recommendations, the ones with the strongest evidence um, that were just revised um, in 2022. And I'm just going to go over them very quickly so that um, we're all on the same page. Um, so the first one is back to sleep for every sleep. Um, use a firm, flat, non-inclined sleep surface to reduce the risk of suffocation or wedging and entrapment. Um, and Jonathan's going to talk about that a little bit because um, this year we added um, the terms flat and non-inclined um, because of some biomechanical data that, um, that Jonathan's going to talk about. 
Um, the next recommendation is feeding of human milk is recommended because it is reduced, it is associated with reduced risk of SIDS. Um, it is recommended that babies sleep in the parent's room close to the parent's bed, but on a separate surface designed for the baby, uh, ideally for at least the first six months. Um, keep soft objects, and there's a whole list of them, such as, but not limited to, pillows, pillow-like toys, quilts, comforters, mattress toppers, fur-like materials, and loose bedding, such as blankets and non-fitted sheets, away from the baby's um, sleep area to reduce the risk of SIDS, suffocation, entrapment, wedging, and strangulation. Um, offering a pacifier at nap time and bedtime is recommended to reduce the risk of SIDS, um, avoid smoke and nicotine exposure during pregnancy and after birth. Also avoid alcohol, marijuana, opioids, and illicit drug use during pregnancy and after birth. And then last but not least, avoid overheating and head covering in babies. So I think most of you are familiar with those recommendations. Um, and I just want to go through very, very quickly why. Um, this, this is, um, I could talk for an hour on pathophysiology. But basically what I want you to know is that there are two major reasons why risk factors are risk factors. One is because they make it more difficult for the baby to wake up, for the baby to arouse. So if you have the baby on their stomach or on their side, um, every grandmother and every childcare provider will tell you that babies sleep better on their stomachs or side. And that is true. On sleep studies, they are more difficult to arouse and they sleep, um, and so that's a problem. Um, so when you have a baby on their back, um, they actually, they have more awakenings. Um, and even though that can be annoying for parents, that is actually protective. Um, another example is smoke exposure. Um, prenatal and environmental smoke exposure decreases the baby's ability to arouse. Um, it, 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 there's, um, it, it probably has um, to do with uh, brainstem mechanic mechanisms that nicotine um, affects. And back sleeping, breastfeeding, room sharing without bed sharing, and pacifier use all increase arousability. They make it easier for you to wake up. Um, the second reason why risk factors are risk factors is, are because they uh, create potentially asphyxiating environments. Um, scam likely, we all like those calls. Um, so they create potentially asphyxiating environments. So bed sharing, soft bedding, prone and side sleeping. Um, so these are all, um, th this is, these are why the risk factors are risk factors. And so if you are in a potentially asphyxiating environment, so for instance, you are, you have your face buried in, in soft bedding and you can't get enough oxygen, you're not, and if you can't wake up to change um, how you are, are sleeping and change your situation, then that's what, that's what happens and that's how you die. Okay, so when we look at these recommendations, all of these recommendations impact arousal. So breastfeeding, um, feeding of human milk, um, babies who, um, who, uh, are fed with human milk, um, they wake up more frequently and those awakenings are protective. Um, there are a lot of other things about human milk that are protective, but, it, but in terms of arousal, that is a big day thing. Um, baby sleeping in the parent's room is um, impacts arousal because if the baby is sleeping there next to the parent, every time the parent makes a noise or moves or um, takes a sigh, then the baby will move a little bit, wake up a little bit, maybe not fully, but we'll wake a little bit. And every time the baby um, moves or um, makes a noise, the parent will wake up a little bit. And we believe that those little awakenings are what are protective. Um, pacifier, um, uh, the studies are a little bit conflicting, but it, it appears that at least for some children, it does impact on arousal. And then I already talked about smoke and nicotine exposure. Um, the alcohol and all of those, they can affect arousal as well. The other thing that's important to know is that these affect arousal of the parent. Um, and particularly if you are in a bed sharing situation, those, um, those uh, substances, use of those substances, um, increases your risk um, exponentially. And then overheating and head covering, um, also um, just warmth um, tends to impact on arousal as well. And then these um, uh, recommendations all uh, can decrease the risk of asphyxiating environments. 
Okay, so basically the goals of the safe sleep guidelines are to increase arousability and to decrease those asphyxiating environments. Okay, so one of the things that, um, one of the big barriers that we see from parents, um, besides the fact that babies sleep better on their stomachs, is, the, is this concern about um, choking. And so I just, I, I posted this and it, this was posted several times in the Twitter chat this morning, but I just want to remind you that babies are at no increased risk of aspirating if they are on their back. So here over on the left is a baby on the back. And you can see that if the baby, um, if the food comes up the esophagus, that, um, that the food has to actually go up against gravity in order to go into the trachea and cause aspiration. Whereas if the baby is on the stomach, um, the food can come out of the esophagus and will just, and, and gravity will just force it or not force it, will allow it to go more easily down into the trachea. And so many times just showing them a photo, a picture like this, a drawing like this can really impact a parent's um, understanding of why they don't have to worry about aspiration. Okay, so I'm gonna, I stop sharing there. Um, and, um, and I just wanted to cover a couple of other um, myths and misconceptions um, uh, and how to talk about them. So, um, so one of the um, concerns that parents often have is about um, wanting to be close to the baby and be, being able to monitor their baby. And um, you just want to, um, I think that it's important to acknowledge that that is important to the parents, but you can be close to them by having them in your room and not in your bed. Um, and you can monitor them very easily if they're right next to your bed. So um, I sometimes have parents who say that the, the uh, pack and play of the crib is at the foot of the bed, and I encourage them if there's space to put it um, at the side of the bed because that way the parent can just roll over and, and check on the baby. Um, and then the, we already talked about babies sleeping better on their stomach. Um, there, one of the other things that was uh, of concern was um, babies who have reflux and whether or not the head of the bed needs to be elevated. It doesn't. And um, like I said, Jonathan's going to talk about inclined sleep products and why those are, those are problematic. Um, babies are going to be the safest on their back and flat on their back. There actually is absolutely no evidence that a baby who is on their back, if they are in, at an incline, um, if that, that 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 helps with reflux. There's absolutely no evidence of that. Um, and if babies are uh, in some inclined uh, pro uh, products such as car seats, they're, they're actually um, kind of bent at right at the angle, um, right at their abdomen level, um, and that can actually increase uh, reflux. Um, okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there and let any of the other panelists uh, uh, comment or add to what I have just said. I could add the uh, the thought that um, bear is best in the crib is a message that you want to be pushing uh, to new parents all the time. But I would like to add to that that firm is fine because people think that babies need a really soft, cushiony surface to sleep on, and they really do not. And it can introduce all kinds of hazards into a sleep environment when a new parent is trying to fluff up the baby's sleep surface. So bear is best and firm is fine. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in. One, can you still use hats in the hospital? Um, so we, um, in the, the newest recommendation, we have said that you can still use hats in the hospital while the baby is transitioning, but by the time the baby goes home, the baby should not need the, to use the hat anymore, and we recommend that they don't use hats. Um, another question is about the head shape, um, this being a big concern of parents and nurses. Um, in general, the head shape uh, will, will um, it will be fine um, as long as the baby's not on their back all the time. So what, where we see the problems with plagiocephaly is when we have babies that are on their back all the time when they're asleep and awake. So we want to make sure that we have tummy time available for them. And then we also want to um, encourage them not to be parked in car seats or um, places like that where they have that constant pressure on the back of their head. Um, we'll talk about some of these other questions as we go through, um, but why don't I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Jonathan so he can talk about product safety. Thanks so much. So 
I work for the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and we are a small federal agency tasked with regulating the products in your life. Anything that's not a food, not a drug, not a medical device, not a car or a gun. But basically everything else is a consumer product, and there are over 15,000 categories that we cover with just about between 500 and 600 staff members uh, for the entire country. So um, I want to answer just basically three questions. Why are there so many products that are that are not safe out there and talk about the role of my agency and the FDA. And I wanna answer the question, how do we identify unsafe products? And I wanna address inclined sleepers and the biomechanical data that we have about the safety of those products. So first let's start with why are there so many recalls? Why are there so many products that seem unsafe out there? First, I wanna say of the millions of products sold, it's actually a very small percentage that are recalled, but we hear about them a lot. And we seem to hear about them more than we would expect. And I'll tell you why the FDA has the authority and the power given by the Congress to make sure that medicines are checked out before they go on the market. The CPSC does not have that authority for consumer products. The CPSC is a, a really reactive agency. I find out that somebody got hurt and then that starts the ball rolling. Now, um, a lot of consumers assume that their strollers and their high chairs and their cribs and their players have been checked by somebody before they were put on the shelves for sale. Not so. Uh, a product can come from anywhere in the country and be imported, put on the shelves and sold. We won't find out about it until somebody gets hurt. So you might wonder, well, you know, is this a really good way of regulating safety? Well, these products are covered by overarching uh, legislation. The Consumer Product Safety Act of 1972 requires the manufacturers to not put unreasonable risks of injury into the marketplace. So in, a, in essence, everything that's a consumer product is regulated. It's just that we don't find out about hazards and we don't investigate hazards until there's been an incident. That being said, we can be proactive in the sense that the agency can promulgate voluntary standards Voluntary standards, also called consensus standards, are multidisciplinary uh, teams of researchers coming together to make basically their own regulations. Rather than the government making the regulations, the industry and consumers come together to make a regulation. Now, in America, uh, since 2008, we've been on a treadmill of making these voluntary standards into mandatory rules. So they became mandatory, but they started their lives, these standards, they started their lives in the industry's um, standards development organizations. So those standards are super important for understanding how we get uh, to where we are in the marketplace. How do we identify unsafe products? Well, incident reports. Consumers report to us uh, through um, our hotline or also online at our main portal for incident review, which is uh, saferproducts.gov and anybody can make a report about a consumer product related uh, incident or injury or even concern there at saferproducts.gov. Those reports that come to us uh, are actually reviewed by a multidisciplinary team here at the agency, including engineers, health scientists, pharmacologists, toxicologists, human factors, engineers, and child psychologists, who are all experts in what people do to get hurt, right? And those reviews then trickle into um, uh, reviews in the voluntary standards arena where people invent regulations for themselves and for their industry to make sure that those incidents that we know happened don't happen again. So how do we identify unsafe products? Somebody got hurt. Behind every regulation, there's a tragedy. Behind every performance requirement in a voluntary standard, there's an incident where we know somebody got hurt. And what we look at are coroner's reports, first responder observations, sheriffs, uh, responses, engineering analysis. We look at um, epidemiology reviews of all these teams. And it's a fascinating study because we do this case by case and uh, product category by product category in the voluntary standards arena. What we're looking for are ways we can change the way people are manufacturing products so that they're less dangerous, less hazardous, and we can remove some of those hazards from the market. Now, this incident review happens mostly for juvenile products at the American Society of Testing and Materials, also called ASTM. And the ASTM is a standards developer, which is an umbrella organization that organizes these multidisciplinary teams. And you can participate in that. 
anybody in the, in the country, actually anybody in the world can join an ASTM subcommittee if they want to. And I would like to encourage anybody who's interested in preventing ch child death to volunteer for voluntary standards development. And you can do this at ASTM.org. Now membership in the committees is $75 a year, but you get access to every committee that ASTM has, and you are given a vote as well in the creation of these standards and the performance requirements that will, at least in the juvenile product category, eventually become mandatory regulations in the United States. It's a tremendous power that citizens have, and most people don't know that they can do that. And it gets better. They need consumers. And if you are a consumer with medical expertise, you are an instant celebrity in those subcommittees. So not only is it interesting, helpful for society, but it's also good for your ego. And if it sounds like I'm trying to sell this, it's because I am. As an activist or an advocate for child safety, you can have a direct impact on the future of regulations for juvenile products in this country just by participating as a consumer. It's not a, a huge uh, time commitment between four and 12 hours a year or more if you wanted to get more active. Uh, sometimes they only meet once a year, sometimes twice a year. But if anybody's interested in volunteering at ASTM, you can contact me at consumerombudsman at cpsc.gov. Um, and I'll be, happy to, uh, I'll be happy to walk you through the process of joining. So let's talk about inclined sleepers just briefly. Uh, inclined sleepers were a new product of uh, 17 or 15 or 17 years ago, give or take. Uh, and it was an attempt to uh, make a product that was uh, similar to a bouncer. Uh, yeah, the email, again, contact you, consumerombudsman at cpsc.gov. Um, yeah, inclined sleepers were, we knew that people were um, letting their children sleep all night in a bouncer. And some people were letting their children sleep all night in a swing. So uh, the people who were inventing children's products thought maybe we should make something that was similar to a bouncer and similar to a swing, but maybe more safe for overnight sleep. And um, that inclined sleeper came on the market with some research. Uh, I believe there was a pediatrician somewhere who looked at it and thought it seemed okay. But uh, like I said, the CPSC does not give pre-market approval to any new kind of product that comes on the market. We don't have the ability to say, oh, we think that's a little sketchy. You shouldn't sell it. So it goes on the market. And after some years of uh, analysis, some incidents started to trickle in and the staff was baffled by this. There were children found turned over face down in these inclined sleepers. And we eventually, uh, through uh, just a really an inability to explain what was going on, we contracted with a biomechanical expert at the University of Arkansas named, named Aaron Mannon. And Dr. Mannon did studies of with really live subjects. She, her first initial study only had uh, 10 live babies. Uh, but what she did is she put sensors in the crib area and she had it so that the crib could be tilted at different uh, angles to incline the, the child. And they looked at the pressure points underneath the babies and they looked at um, uh, the, the pulse uh, oximetry of the babies in certain positions. And over time, of these observations, they were able to really um, get a better sense of what might be happening in inclined sleepers when children were able to twist and roll over. And the incline seemed to be facilitating the, the flipping from back to front. And once they were on their front, they were in a very unfamiliar position that involved muscle groups that would not normally have been used and could lead to fatigue where the child's neck and, and upper shoulder girdle were fatigued and then they suffocate in a prone position in the inclined sleeper. I've simplified it, and I'll put here in the um, in the chat links to uh, the actual research, and you can read um, those at your own leisure. Dr. Mannon has published several things since then. Uh, there's the last PubMed article is a continuation of the study of inclined sleep. So the first one, the first link there is the safe sleep information from the CPSC, and it, it includes Dr. Mannon's report on that page, a link to it. Uh, and that's the second link in the Federal Register. So um, I'm happy to answer any other questions about how we identify hazards, but uh, we can leave that for, for a later discussion. Rachel, I'll yield back my time. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions that have come up. One is, um, one is about what we should recommend for mothers when swaddling. 
Um, and, um, and Barb, do you wanna take that one? How do you talk to moms about squaddling? Well, <clears throat> we start with the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations and then we have conversations with them, which is what we're going to get into in the next part, is really find out what they know, why they built, they where they get their information, where they get their uh, parenting practices, uh, and where they get their information, and then how they decide what they're going to do. So what is their concern and why is this, um, you know, why do they feel like they, that um, swaddle is important? Are their babies waking up? Uh, we talk about once babies get moving, um, that if they get themselves over someplace and they're swaddled, they can't get themselves out. They need to be able to move, use their hands to get out. And why it's again, more important to make sure nothing is in the crib uh, when a baby is swaddled. Uh, we're hearing a lot about families that are swaddling under the arms so baby's hands are free or one hand is free and just having those conversations with families. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. um, another question, um, and I'll take this one because this is uh, as a result of something I had said, what should we recommend mothers to use when they want to get um, things done around the house and the babies are up? And I just said that we don't want babies parked in car seats and things like that. So we don't want babies parked in car seat 24 seven. Okay, if you need to get something done for 30 minutes or something like that, I think that's fine, um, as long as you're watching the baby. But we don't want the baby in there all the time. Just remember that, that the baby, um, that pressure on the back of the head is not 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 good um, for the plagiocephaly. And then, um, and, um, and then you can, you can also, we also do recommend, you know, uh, you can use the, the baby wearing the baby wearing things as long as the baby's head and neck are up and their airway is straight because remember um, one of the things that um, about the incline products is that it's easy for the baby's head to kind of bend down and um, and that can um, can cause a, pos a positional asphyxia and it's since the baby's head is so heavy compared to the rest of the body that it's hard for them to keep their head up, which is why um, the in, another reason why inclined sleepers are problematic. So, um, so uh, remember that the baby's airway is like a straw and you wanna keep it straight. Um, and so making sure that the baby's head and neck are up straight is great and what we want. Okay, so now we're gonna move to Rebecca, who's gonna talk about some um, things with regards to hospital policies. Um, so as, as I said earlier, I'm Rebecca Carlin and I'm, I'm a pediatric hospitalist. I spend most of my time on the wards now, um, but I have previously spent time in the nursery and I've done some outpatient peds. Um, and my research has to do a lot with uh, changing social norms around behaviors. And I think that that's really relevant to a lot of what we're going to talk about, about hospital policies. So as many of you who are in the hospital probably know, if you walk around, there's often unsafe sleep environments um, for similar reasons to why there are unsafe sleep environments at home. Nurses have a four to one ratio, babies are fussy. Uh, there's a lot of older social norms around uh, or older hospital norms around putting bassinets and cribs at inclines, um, putting a lot of positioners into cribs to hold uh, infants in the same place. And because this has been going on for so long and babies are often on a monitor, people really assume they're okay. So there's uh, three real locations that we, we're gonna talk about in the hospital. There's the NICU, the newborn nursery, and just the general wards teams. Um, in July of 2021, Michael Goodstein, who is also a, a member of the SIDS task force, was the lead author on the AAP's transition to safe sleep uh, environment for the NICU patient which the link I will, I just put in the chat. Um, and that talks a lot about NICU behavior and around safe sleep and around how to sort of model safe sleep behavior and talk to parents about it. And I think it's really, it's an important area. These babies are for the often premature. There's reasons why physiologically premature babies would in the early months potentially need to be in a more restrictive environment or be in a in an environment that does have, let's say, positioners or other devices in a monitored setting. 
And that's because they're really supposed to still be in a restrictive womb and they're supposed to be still developing. Um, but after 32 weeks, we strongly recommend that safe sleep practices be modeled on all new infants um, if it's safe to do so. And that includes keeping them flat and keeping the bassinets empty um, other than a fitted, a fitted sheet. Um, and I would encourage trainees to really, and nurses and other uh, hospital employees to really speak up about that. Um, it's, it really is a place where it can be hard to speak up, but it is important that we remember that parents are walking into this and seeing their children in these positions every single day. And if this is the norm in the NICU, it's going to be the norm at home. Um, I would echo the same sentiment in the nursery um, where there actually has been a lot of safe sleep work at a lot of, uh, in, a, in a lot of hospitals trying to do crib checks and do more education on safe sleep. And in some hospitals, parents sign a safe sleep um, information sheet at discharge. We really encourage hospitals to try to talk to parents both prenatally and then again postnatally about the safe sleep guidelines and the risk of SIDS. And then again, model safe sleep behavior. There's now um, a Cribs for Kids safe sleep certification for hospitals, which involves the whole hospital, um, but is particularly focused on the nursery um, in terms of its education. And there's been a lot of work around breastfeeding, which we very much support. It definitely lowers the rates of SIDS and has many other health benefits. Um, but with that can also come some um, leanings towards bed sharing and, um, and other less safe sleep, uh, other riskier uh, safe sleep environments. So <clears throat> the certification really can both help change policies, which are very powerful in the hospital and which can really change norms in the hospital. And it also just elevates the issue much the way um, breastfeeding policies have really have changed uh, in the hospital. And so I will also put a link to the safe sleep certification from Crips for Kids into the chat. So you guys can review the certification guidelines and the manual. There's a safe sleep toolkit. Uh, there's a lot of resources about how to uh, improve the safe sleep environments with, throughout the entire hospital in that. Um, and again, I would say that really policy in the hospital is how you change things. So there's a lot of practices that just get passed down from nurse to nurse. A, a nurse will inherit a patient who's on an incline with position nurse around them because they have bronchiolitis and no one will really think twice about that. We really need to speak up and talk about it because it is, it is unsafe and it is also setting a precedent that lets parents think it's safe at home. Thank you. Um, thanks for, we're getting a lot of stuff in the chat. Um, so one thing uh, for you, Rebecca, is the, hus are, um, is the hospital still encouraging swaddling as a policy overall? Uh, we have been told by many new parents that it is when, uh, when they provide uh, SIDS training in the community. So the task force doesn't actually really take a position on swaddling as being less as being riskier or, or safer um, in the early period until, because there's not really data on that. And so for a lot of babies who do better when they're swaddled, they sleep better, they um, are less fussy, it's a way to soothe the baby to make them feel comforted. I think that in the hospital, we, you can encourage that. We do encourage it in a way that's tightly swaddled. So there's a lot of swaddles that are made with Velcro to keep them done so that they are not, um, they don't come out over the baby's face. And then I also think it's important to talk to families about the fact that it's really only safe to swaddle until, as Barb was saying, a baby is getting more mobile and is starting to roll. So while that typically happens at four months, for some babies, they're really getting ready to start to roll at two or three months. And so you really have to talk to parents early about how they're going to transition out of swaddling. There is also a lot of encouragement of a wearable blanket, which doesn't restrict the baby in the same way. And uh, giving out wearable blankets is part of the Cribs for Kids Safe Sleep Certification um, Kit, because that is, that is obviously safer um, throughout 
development um, and as a good long-term solution. Okay, thank you. Um, there, okay, so um, the, I just wanna say that the, the, the child, the car seat people are very unhappy with me um, because um, uh, I said that it would be okay temporarily and they're very adamant about how car seats should be used for transportation only and not for indoor seating or sleep time. Um, you know, with regards to safe sleep, in terms of the car seats, um, they would not, we would not want them used for sleep. Um, and we would agree that they should be used for transportation only. Um, and, um, but we don't have any data in terms of SIDS when, um, or unsafe, or when the baby is placed in there when they're awake. So, um, so I just want to clarify that. Um, another question was about child care centers um, and whether or not they, um, if there's new information for them. Um, the, the information is the same as for um, everybody else. And, um, and then, and I know that the AAP is working on revising their training for childcare providers. Um, there's a, uh, somebody who was alarmed when I said that every childcare provider and grandmother will tell you that babies sleep better on their stomachs. Um, and I would agree that there are strict policies for many, many childcare centers, but they're not for everybody, number one. And we still do hear this from parents. Um, so, um, so I just, it's not from all childcare providers and I apologize if, if that misrepresents childcare providers, but, um, but, uh, but we do hear this from parents. Um, uh, another question is what age is safe to add items like a pillow, blanket, stuffed animal, et cetera. Um, our recommendations only go up to one year of age because that's when SIDS technically ends. After that, um, there's no data, honestly. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, Can I just add to that, Rachel? In yes. The, the question, it said that when do a child starts to need a pillow? So um, I think the word need there is important to talk about. Uh, as Jonathan said, uh, like cush is not necessarily better for a baby. I am the mother of a two-year-old. She still doesn't have a pillow. That doesn't mean that some kids won't want a pillow or benefit from a pillow earlier. It's just to say that there really is no time in which you like need these things. It's really about where you are developmentally and desire. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see, Barb, I'm gonna turn to you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we've heard all about what the recommendations are and what the dangers are and, and things that we can implement through the hospital setting, but how does this translate into um, having conversations with families? We can't, we have to really um, do some self-reflection. We can't stereotype or assume each culture, each religion, each race, um, even gender think the same way. So um, everyone sees things very differently. And what we can do is become the trusted uh, source of accurate information, credible information for our families. And we can do that by building relationships. So everybody has a story and um, we can learn what their story is, find out what they know, what they believe. And, and we can do that by meeting families where they are and where they're comfortable. So some things that we can do to set the tone um, is to make sure that our, our waiting rooms, our offices reflect our patient population. Would this make everyone feel comfortable when they came? What about the reading material that's on the coffee tables? Uh, what about the handouts that we're giving? Does that, would that make our, our family, our patients comfortable? And so looking at that is really important. Uh, again, self-reflection on do I uh, welcome my patient's partners, uh, extended family members, do I uh, include them in the conversations that, that um, I'm having? And then how do I start those conversations? Um, and do I ask the question and use preferred pronouns for my patients? 
And I think we have to, as we look at those things, we have to say, if I'm not comfortable doing that, maybe it's not best for me to be this um, this provider for, for this family. We're doing um, more damage if we don't acknowledge, if we aren't able to be comfortable and acknowledge where our, our uh, patients and families are. So then starting with a friendly icebreaker to start those um, relationships and, and build that trust. And, you know, it might be something as simple as um, tell me, you know, if the um, what your baby's name is. Does it have some significance? Who, what does this mean to you? Um, things like that, that just start the conversation. It's a non-threatening, you know, a nice, comfortable topic. And then you can move into um, finding out what parents know. So you don't just start with a litany of do all these things, don't do all these things, but ask them, tell me what you've heard about breastfeeding. What do you know about safe sleep? Um, where do you get your information? Where do you get your parenting information? Or how do you make those decisions about what you're going to do? So start those conversations and then um, just continue those. So then you know where they are, what they need to hear, and you don't have to waste your time on what they already know. And if they know and share something that's not quite accurate, you might say, um, do you mind if I give you some information and then you can share some of yours. But I would really in, um, empower you not to ask, do you have a safe place for your baby to sleep? But rather, where will your baby sleep? Because if you ask, um, do you have a safe place? It might be right here in bed next to me. Uh, so we wanna make sure that what they're saying is a safe place is, um, is really, that and, and a safe place. Um, I think when we have these conversations and we build these relationships, all of our families, all of our patients are so unique. Uh, we get to know them better and have a better trusted uh, relationship. And we become that trusted person because not always our providers um, seen as a, as a trusted resource. So I, I always like to share, and I, I don't think I have time to do it, but um, you can look it up, the, the story about the roast and the, the mom that, uh, the new young bride that planned this dinner and made a roast and cut the end off. And it was her mother's recipe. And when her partner said, why do you do that? Oh, because that's what my mother did. And she, the next day asked the mother, the mother said, because you're, my mother did it. And when they asked grandma, they found out the roast didn't fit in the pan. So sometimes if we have these conversations, we can find out maybe there really isn't a reason why we're doing some of the parenting practices we do. It's just because our parents did it and their parents did it. So those are some of the things that we can do in having those conversations and building those relationships. And then I think um, as we move into the next thing is what do we do when there's an emergency? What can I do to make my babies Say sleep place safe if there's a hurricane or if there's a if I've le uh, left a domestic uh, violence situation or if um, my un unspeakable thing that uh, we've had a house fire whatever those relation whatever those circumstances are I would really encourage you to look at sleep space in a very different lens than you maybe have in the past just to say buy uh, to get a new crib or mattress or whatever is just not enough. I think we have to look at what does that sleep environment look like? Is the mattress firm? If you put your hand down and bring it back up, do you still see the imprint of your hand? Okay, that's not a, that's not a firm mattress. Is what's in this sleep, sleep space? It might be the most expensive crib in the world, but if you put pillows, and blankets and bumper pads and stuffed animals in there, it's now not safe. You can take a dresser drawer for an emergent need and put a light blanket in there and that's a safe place for a baby to sleep. So really think in a little different um, mindset of what does that look like? And it does this meet, uh, create a safe sleep zone. Does this meet the needs for keeping this baby safe until we can get um, 
uh, uh, something else that's that's more permanent. Um, Lorena, would you like to add anything to that? Some resources? Um, yeah, thank you, Barb. I think another thing to keep in mind in terms of educational resources and the way that we message to different families is that there are a couple of groups that have really been left behind in terms of the resources that are available uh, to them. And that's uh, members of the African-American or black communities, as well as American Indian and Alaska Native um, families. Uh, these two groups can experience um, sleep-related infant mortality rates that are two to three times or three to four times higher than their Caucasian counterparts. And that's an absolutely um, not okay uh, disparity. We need as a, as a group of caring advocates um, and family supporters to really address this issue. So one messaging, uh, one type of message does not fit all and uh, neither do educational resources. So it is important to really figure out what the barriers to safe sleep are for each individual family. And that's often when uh, you know we hear that, yes, they've received the pack and play for free and they know that back is best, but they're gonna sleep in bed uh, together with the baby and it's gonna have all the soft fuzzy things. It's important to address the why and to not be judgmental about it. Um, ultimately, they have the power to decide how they're going to care for that baby. So we're there to be allies, to understand their worries or concerns, and to provide uh, factual information in the most respectful and caring way possible that at least gets them to understand why you as their physician or service provider are recommending something different than what feels familiar to them. They may not hear you the first time or the second time, but perhaps they'll stew on that information. And over time, they may change their practice, especially if we can also start to impact the social norms around a particular um, safe sleep practice. So that's when being active on social media and spreading the message of safe infant sleep, talking to grandparents um, as people who pass down knowledge from one generation to the next, involving supporting caregivers and uh, non-primary care providers. Everyone in the community needs to be up to date on the safe sleep practices. And whenever somebody shares that they're doing something less than safe, it's important to address those barriers to understand why they're doing that and to provide them with accurate, caring, factual information. Thank you. We have um, eight minutes left. Um, a couple of other things that have come in the chat. Um, one says, uh, on behalf of Parents Against Tip Overs, please never ever use a dresser drawer for a sleep environment. Um, we would say, and with, with regards to tip overs, that you you would take it out and put it on the floor, um, not that it would be in the in the dresser. Um, we have also a lot of information in the chat. Um, can you know? I not. I'm going to put re repost these to everybody um, about health education and communication um, certification and membership in child prevent uh, prevent child injury is free. Um, so. Um, uh, so that's all important. Um, one question, and I think that other people can can ask, can talk about, is um, about with regards to messaging, because there are a lot of people who know the recommendations but are still not doing it. Um, you know, many of the babies who die are dying in bed sharing situations. So, um, does anybody have any any? ideas, suggestions, things that we can do for, with regards to that. I think I just put some some information in the Q&A, but I think what Barb was talking about is really important um, about trying to determine not just does the baby have a safe place to sleep, but what is actually happening at night so that you can come up with a plan for that's, that's family sensitive. If you have a plan and you've given a recommendation and the family's not going to follow it, it's totally useless. Um, so I think trying to see where a family is at is really important and what the barriers are for them or the cultural restrictions or whatever the reasons may be that they are choosing to uh, bed share. Um, and then also someone asked about exhaustion. And I think intention is really powerful. So coming up with a plan before it's 3 a.m. and you're really, really, really tired and people aren't thinking rationally helps 
make better decisions at that time. And the current sleep, uh, rec in the current recommendations, we actually added a lot of data about different scenarios with co-sleeping that made it more or that made it safer or less safe. So if a parent is intoxicated, it is much more dangerous. If the baby is preemie or they're under four months, it's much more dangerous. And the point of really adding that table was to help have informed conversations with families about how to make their baby as safe as possible and to make a scenario as unrisky as possible. It's not, we're never going to remove all of the risk in bed sharing. We know that, but if we can make it as safe as possible so that it's, it is better to fall asleep in a bed with no soft bedding than it is to fall asleep with an infant on a couch or sitting in a chair. We know that it's riskier on the couch or the chair. And so really having more detailed conversations, I think is important. Okay, so um, there have been a couple of other questions and I'm, uh, let's see. One is um, NICHD uh, safety sleep campaign does not use ABCs of safe sleep messaging, but or other organizations like Cribs for Kids do. Um, is this message beginning to shift away from taglines and towards conversations? And how should public health professionals navigate this shift? Uh, Lorena, do you wanna take that one? Absolutely. Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, NICHD had uh, done several focus groups um, with a diverse number of families and figured out, at least from those results, that the alone in ABC did not resonate with a lot of families. Um, though we understand the intent of that message, but the, the one short phrase didn't, wasn't landing well with a, a significant number of folks. So we started focusing on creating a safe, safe space, as opposed to just saying alone in a, uh, on their back in a crib, which we still absolutely support, but we don't um, break it down into that one uh, sort of soundbite message, if you will. If you go to our website, you'll see that we reinforce over and over um, the AAP recommendations for safe sleep and really try to uh, provide information in different ways. Uh, we use infographics, we have the brochure, which is really meant to be used as a conversation starter. It's not um, the beginning and the end of an educational session. Um, we also have been more active on social media to try to uh, get the attention of younger parents. So uh, hopefully you've seen some of our short reels on our Instagram account. Uh, we know that people communicate in a variety of different ways, and one short message uh, does not uh, a thoughtful conversation make, but what it does do is hopefully at least grab their attention to seek out more information. And it's the process of doing that thoughtfully, respectfully, and in a way that's tailored to your audiences that hopefully will get us to those uh, more complete conversations about how to keep babies safe during sleep time. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, what, okay, so the last question um, is, uh, that's related to this is about risk reduction, rather risk, risk, risk mitigation and talking about risk mitigation, um, while we're still trying to maintain hospital policies, um, and to reach people who are unwilling um, to, um, to listen, or for whom the, the, it, the ABCs don't resonate. Um, so this is a very, very complicated question. Um, a couple of things I would say would be, and people can chime in, um, uh, one is that um, there's a difference between public health messaging and your one-on-one -on -one conversations. So on one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, sh uh, should be uh, family-centered and based on what uh, the information is that the family is telling you. Um, uh, so, so that is one thing. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated question. The AAP has decided that to protect pediatricians and, and, um, and other healthcare professionals that they were not going to use a risk mitigation approach for safe sleep um, because it's such a, a slippery slope. Um, and um, and yeah, so so I think it really really depends. Um, any anybody else have anything to say really very quickly 
like in a half a minute because then we have to close. I think I would just add that we have a responsibility to um, educate new and expectant parents and providers, uh, uh, caregivers on what the um, AAP recommendations and guidelines are. And I think um, Lorena said it earlier that the parents uh, are the ultimate decision makers in where they're going to sleep their baby and how they're gonna feed their, their infants. And so I think we have a responsibility to share that information. And then like you said, Rachel, uh, have those conversations, those one-on-one -on -one conversations to help uh, parents see and realize the why is the importance of it and um, how they can do it as, as safe as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, it is three o'clock. I'm going, you know, we could go on for hours, obviously. Um, and so what I would say, I, I wanna first thank the, um, the participants of the webinar. This has been fabulous. Um, I hope that to all of the participants that you picked up some information that will help you. Um, I hope that you continue the conversations that have started today. And, and I just wanna say, we are, I am so thrilled that all of you trainees chose Safe Sleep. It really gives me hope, for, gives all of us hope for the future. Um, and I also want you to continue the messaging. Um, at the beginning of this webinar, we were at more than 7.7 .7 million impressions already um, from uh, hashtag clear the crib, um, which is more than twice the total impressions in 24 hours for past days of action. So you guys rock and keep going and keep um, searching uh, hashtag clear the crib and keep uh, messaging. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'm going to end here. Thank you. Thank you.